So I'd like to congratulate you who did the debate. It's been very good that you've studied well. Since we came to exile, in the monasteries, especially in the nunneries, where they used to only do the tantric rituals in the past, but not study uh, philosophy, and debate, and logic. So many of them, there were many of these nunneries and monasteries in Tibet who did only that. And of course, uh, nunneries didn't really use to have any uh, study of logic and philosophy. So this has been our kind of a custom in Tibet, uh, that the nunneries didn't have any uh, program for debate and logic, study of logic. So for hundreds of years we have lived like that. So do we need to keep this tradition, continue with it or not? You have to check whether that even if it's a tradition or custom, whether it's something which is beneficial or something which is a, a drawback. You have to think about it. So this, in, in the case of this, uh, it's a drawback. And therefore, after coming to it, it's uh, monasteries like uh, Namgyal Monastery and also Gyudu and Gyume Tantric Colleges, uh, where they didn't used to have any uh, study of logic, philosophy. And also the nunneries uh, with regard to the bhikshuni ordination, it has to be done according to the Vinaya. It has to be done according to the uh, Vinaya and also uh, to the uh, discussion done by the Vinaya holders. But we can definitely do the study of logic and philosophy. And it has been so far very fruitful uh, that these, uh, it has been done in the nunneries. And then in the in the recent years, we have, uh, I have uh, asked people to uh, study if they are really interested in Buddhism, um, and its material practice, they have to uh, do studies. So it is, Buddhism is talking about uh, cultivating happiness through study and practice, not just through prayers. At our, in our homes, we do uh, arrange the altar and do prayers. So, uh, it's kind of Buddhism is about the practice of Buddhism and uh, gaining the experience. It's not just, uh, it doesn't come through prayers. So, we're talking about uh, purifying our mind of all the negativities which has to come through study and practice. It doesn't come just through uh, a mere faith, uh, blind faith is not enough for that. But we have to uh, cultivate faith based on reason. So if you don't see the reason to do Dharma practice, uh, and if you don't really understand it, then your faith would be just blind faith. So the faith in Buddhism has to be uh, generated based on reason. And therefore, I have uh, in, uh, urged people to study Buddhism uh, to the Tibetans, as well as people in the Himalayan regions we have, who have um, the same kind of cultural uh, tradition uh, as Tibet. And even uh, I also asked 
Chinese who take interest in Buddhism, and people from Korea and Japanese. We have one Japanese here today, um, and also Vietnamese. So whoever has interest and uh, faith in Buddhism, uh, where Buddhism is their traditional religion, I have uh, been urging them to study Buddhism. Spanish. Spanish in Spain, the, uh, the majority religion is the main religion is that of uh, Catholicism. So the Spanish here is an exception. So that she has taken in interest in Buddhism and particularly uh, has taken interest in study uh, logic and debate. So with regards to the uh, uh, procedure of debate, we, they, we use the t uh, terms like Tao and Chiron. It's like a, a So uh, with regard to logic, it is something which is common to uh, Buddhism and non-Buddhist. So in general, logic is something common to Buddhist and non-Buddhist. Just as we have other uh, sciences like uh, arts and crafts and so forth. So with regard to this logic, we, uh, when we study it in connection with Buddhism, uh, we do not uh, we, we do study it in connection with Buddhism and not with other uh, subjects. So perhaps if we could uh, innovate. Uh, System studying logic in connection with other uh, subjects, perhaps we could innovate in the world uh, using this logic uh, in connection with other subjects. This could be something new. So, the procedure of debate and study of logic, even if you're not uh, Buddhist, you can study, uh, you should study it. So if we could, uh, we could uh, add this to this, our uh, subjects, our uh, curriculum in schools, perhaps it could be an innovation. So as I have uh, been urging people to study, uh, study logic and debate, accordingly uh, from amongst the lay people, uh, you have started a program study so I've seen some progress in it which was very good so I uh, congratulate you so if, gradually if we could uh, use it uh, this uh, system of debate and logic uh, in uh, all kinds of uh, subjects that we study It would be an example to the world at large. So we have to keep this in mind. It's a goal. So whether we are able to accomplish it or not is a different matter, but we have to, it's possible. We have to keep it, keep it in mind that it's something possible that we can accomplish. So when we do debate, uh, perhaps we have to, uh, it's a point of, to consider whether we need really to uh, stand up and uh, stamp our feet and clap our hands when we debate. If you, if the kids, school kids were to do this in class, perhaps uh, it would be a problem for uh, the, st the students who are uh, a little bit timid in class. So for me, this is the case. 
Whereas if I if I uh, have to s if I sit and do debate uh, by snapping my hands, then it's easier for me. So for the students in uh, schools, if uh, I don't know if you, they need to uh, stand up and uh, stamp their feet on the ground and clap their hands, whether that's necessary or not, I don't know. But we can have this kind of uh, debate by sitting on a chair. Uh, perhaps one uh, student could uh, give answer, the rest of the uh, class could uh, ask questions without having to stand up. So, if uh, in the beginning, of course, uh, it may be better for uh, the classes to do debate by sitting on chair, uh, where one person answers and the rest of the class asks questions. But uh, and as they progress further and further, and they become more uh, adept at debating, and uh, then perhaps they could sit, stand up, and debate uh, like the traditional uh, way, uh, clapping the hands and stamping their feet on the ground, and so on. So you have to know the reason. On the one hand, if you have uh, uh, faith in Buddhism, then you have to uh, generate that faith based on reason, understanding the teaching. So on the other hand, it's something which is useful for uh, everyone, whether you are uh, Buddhist or not. Uh, for any kind of study that you do, it's a very useful uh, tool. So we have uh, collected monks from different uh, monastic institutions to study science. And uh, most of the teachers who teach these monks are volunteers. Uh, most of them are Americans. And uh, these teachers are really happy to teach these monks. And the uh, monks do, do not know English. Um, and uh, also they, didn't know, they don't know math. But the teachers have found that these monks have very, have very acute mind for uh, investigation. Uh, that's because uh, the reason why they have such an acute uh, mind is because of the uh, debate that they have uh, done for many years. So we have to have a very uh, broad uh, go to study debate logic. So that's one thing. And then uh, for the talk today, which we, uh, I have started a few years ago, um, and I, we have started this uh, program of introducing uh, Buddhism. It has been very beneficial so far. Why that is so is because as human beings we have uh, the three poisons of desire, hatred and uh, ignorance. So the six billion people on this earth, if you look at them, we create our own problems and uh, while we become unhappy uh, through our own creations, uh, we uh, create problems for others because of hatred and so forth. And how many people there are who do such thing, and uh, even amongst the leaders, how many people there are who uh, ruin other people's life as well in the world. So the six billion people on earth do not want happiness, but want uh, do not want suffering, but happiness. Uh, 
even though there is the case, uh, the, the suffering is endless for them, like the ripples of the water. So it has been like this, and it will be like this for the future. If you think about this carefully, uh, these problems do not come from the machines that people have created, but because of wrong ways of handling their mind, uh, being overcome with uh, love and hate. So suffering uh, boils down. The, the cause of suffering is root, uh, that of uh, our mind, uh, the undisciplined mind. Because our mind is so overwhelmed by these three poisons, uh, and people lack the introduction to uh, seeing these poisons as something negative, and then uh, as a result of these poisons, uh, people uh, experience suffering. In all different religions, there, there's the teaching of love, compassion, tolerance, and so forth patients, uh, mainly uh, based on uh, faith, uh, on their respective uh, gods, uh, uh, or in Muslim Islam they call Allah, in Hinduism they call Brahma and so forth. But uh, these different traditions do not point to the negative thoughts and emotions, attachment, desire, hatred, and so forth, as the uh, fundamental cause of uh, problems. So although all these traditions, uh, different religious traditions, teach love, compassion, affection, um, and so forth, they do not point uh, to these negative uh, states of mind as being the cause of suffering. It's only Buddhism, um, seems, which does that, um, pointing uh, the negative states of mind as being the causes of uh, uh, suffering. And the root of all these different negative states of mind is uh, identified as ignorance. So, dimuk or ignorance, close-mindedness, is something which is uh, not unawareness. So this has to be overcome through uh, wisdom, uh, not through faith. Uh, so therefore there is so much emphasis in Buddhism on uh, cultivating wisdom. Because it is the only factor that uh, uh, goes counter to the ignorance. So we, as uh, Buddhists, uh, traditionally, so we have a, a very uh, good opportunity, and therefore we have to recognize it and uh, try to use this opportunity to study the Buddhism. Uh, we cannot say that Buddhism is very sacred and a great religion, and therefore all uh, everybody in the world has to become Buddhist. So this is not going to happen. Uh, religion cannot be forced on people. So people have to voluntarily accept it. The, the six billion people have the right to uh, follow a religion or not, whether they become, whether they want to be believers or non-believers, it's still, they have the right and the freedom. But for us, as Buddhist Tibetans and as Buddhists, so uh, Buddhism, which uh, identifies the cause of all these problems and faults in the world, and how do the, the uh, problems arise, whether they are causes or not, uh, down to the fundamental the root cause. Uh, Buddhism does that. Uh, all the uh, sh shortcomings in our life, prob problems in our life, come from our uh, 
attachment and angle and so forth, and these are rooted in uh, ignorance. And therefore, we can do such analysis. Um, there is such analysis in Buddhism. Although everyone in the world, the six billion people, are equal in the sense of not wanting and suffering, but wanting happiness. So, uh, to overcome these uh, uh, negativities in our minds, we have a special opportunity um, to serve the people in the world. And the other, uh, secondly, it is very important for us is the buttons. Uh, to uh, keep up with our uh, religious tradition. In the beginning, when we came to exile, uh, people took pity on us. And And in the past, in the attempts uh, were looked at, uh, when Buddhism has been looked at as Islamism, and, and in, in the Lop San Ramba has written a book. He said, uh, the, he talked about third eye, and by practicing Tibetan Buddhism, he made such uh, comments. And then uh, Tibetan Buddhism has been called Islamism because of the external uh, things that people uh, see of Tibetan Buddhism in terms of uh, like jump dance and so forth, where people wear masks. But slowly after coming into exile, people have uh, found opportunity to study Tibetan Buddhism more and more, and uh, Westerners come, became, uh, have come into the Tibetan societies and then done research on Buddhism and found that uh, uh, Tibetans have been using um, the, uh, those who have used their intelligence, human intelligence, to the utmost are perhaps, I think, uh, scientists. So if you follow a certain tradition, and then uh, when you tend to take side of it, um, for us Tibetans, when we talk about Buddhism, we uh, tend to lean towards I mean, the Buddhism as being something uh, good. And so that is rather biased. But in Buddhism, we talk about uh, being unbiased and intelligent and uh, someone who's interested in pursuing their path. So if you are not uh, unbiased, if you are uh, unbiased, then even if the, some teachings of the Buddhism, uh, the Buddha himself, uh, could be uh, in terms of like self, the theory of selflessness, uh, if you use your intelligence and do uh, examine this, this uh, <coughs> there is reason. At some point, uh, sometimes Buddha has uh, uh, taught uh, a grosser form of uh, selflessness. And the reason why Buddha has taught this is because for uh, at that point of time, uh, for such a uh, disciple, it was uh, useful in order to lead them away from nihilism. So, to s the uh, gross form of selflessness is not the ultimate uh, teaching of the Buddha. So, even these teachings have to cannot be taken uh, literally, uh, even if they teach uh, this rough uh, idea of selflessness. So, it is important for us to be unbiased. We have even amongst the scientists, perhaps uh, uh, there are people who may be biased. For example, the communists, Chinese communists, uh, they talk about uh, being scientific and all that, but uh, the, what they really want is uh, are things which are uh, according to their uh, 
own idea ideology so they are not uh, completely open and do investigation so scientists have to be unbiased without taking uh, uh, having any kind of attachments to their own subjects so we're not talking about uh, the morality uh, when the scientists do their investigation there's no talk about morality um, in, in Buddhism also this is the case. When we do investigation, we don't think about whether something is uh, something uh, that we should adopt or discard. But uh, the reality, we are trying to find the reality. And then the next step is that of uh, going into the issue of morality. So in the last 50 uh, we came into exile in 1959, and uh, in the 60s and 70s, and particularly in the 80s, uh, we have come to contact with scientists. And uh, scientists who are unbiased, um, a very uh, famous uh, scientist, uh, well-known scientist, respected scientists have taken uh, interest in Tibetan Buddhism. This has not happened because we bribed them or we have not requested to them by giving a uh, million uh, rupees or dollars and asked them to uh, take interest in Buddhism. We don't have that money, of course. Uh, nor uh, have these scientists taken interest in Tibetan Buddhism uh, by force. Uh, like the Chinese do in Tibet. So as we say, if you uh, are worth, then people will uh, uh, value you. So this Buddhism that we have, Tibetan Buddhism, uh, has come from uh, Nalanda. The practice of Vinaya uh, monastic codes or the practice of uh, Abhidharma, the lower Abhidharma are uh, common to the Pali tradition as well. And then there is the upper Abhidharma, higher Abhidharma and then Madhyamaka and uh, uh, Pramana, or logic and epistemology, uh, the Buddhism becomes broader. And uh, Tibetan sans uh, tradition is Sanskrit tradition, whereas Chinese also uh, Chinese Buddhism is also Sanskrit tradition, but uh, there's difference. Uh, they do not have a uh, study of uh, logic and epistemology, and uh, they do not have the study of uh, or epistemology and logic, uh, as founded by Shandarakshita uh, and Kamalashil. And also, they are, do not have the study of uh, Prasanna Pada, a clear word of Chandra Kirti, and they do not study this. And so, uh, since uh, these uh, studies and these texts did not exist in Chinese, they have not also gone to Japan, Korea, and Vietnam, and so forth, because uh, Buddhism in these countries came, uh, came from uh, China. So, uh, Whereas in Tibetan Buddhism, we have study and texts of all these uh, different fields. And Buddhism was established in Tibet by uh, Master Shantarakshita, who was himself uh, a Madhyamaka scholar. And he was also a great uh, scholar of uh, scholar of Pramana, or logic and epistemology. Right from in the beginning of his text, the uh, Madhyamaka Lankara, uh, he starts uh, uh, by uh, engaging in debate. Historically, we talk about uh, how Shang's coming into Tibet, and uh, but mainly they focused on uh, meditation, co uh, concentration. And uh, also, perhaps, still uh, meditated on, did meditation on uh, certain techniques for um, 
taking rebirth in Sugavati lands. And so when there was danger in Tibet of uh, such a uh, system um, taking root in Tibet, then uh, Kamala Shila came uh, and uh, emphasized on uh, investigation. Uh, of course, the uh, Kamala may have rejected or objected to this uh, no thoughts meditation, but uh, he, is, he said that alone is not enough uh, for uh, practicing Buddhism, that we need to do investigation. And so since then, uh, the, uh, this, the tradition of considering or regarding the uh, study of logic and cosmology in, uh, uh, in Tibetan tradition uh, perhaps the, uh, the system of debate itself in Tibet was uh, 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 as we do it today uh, may have started during the time of the Chava Chuja Senke in the 11th century, so. but uh, the basic uh, structure of debate itself is uh, found in the traditional texts that have been translated from India. So as Tibetans, we have to uh, be confident and proud about uh, in order to have pride and confidence. Um, we, it should come from uh, based on Tibetan Buddhism. It does not come from uh, Tibetan uh, bark or the uh, eating uh, raw meat uh, and so forth. So these do not really uh, make us proud. Uh, Tibetan medicine is something really good. Um, so Tibetan Buddhism uh, is a complete Buddhism, and particularly the uh, demonstrating it and establishing it through uh, the, uh, the logic and epistemology is something that we have to be, uh, we can be proud of, we can uh, show off to the world. So such a Buddhism that we have, Tibetan Buddhism, which is a complete uh, teaching of the Buddha, which has the study of Madhyamaka and logic and epistemology uh, to explain uh, this uh, system, we have Tibetan. And there's nothing like Tibetan which can explain these. Of course, uh, the Ganjur and Tanjur were uh, originally in Sanskrit. Uh, so the major texts of the Madhyamaka and the logic epistemology were in Sanskrit. And then, but uh, there's uh, no real uh, good explanation that uh, it can be given based on the Sanskrit text. So therefore, to study these Madhyamaka and epistemology and so forth, uh, t Tibetan language is something that we can proud of. So if you think that studying Buddhism is something, um, an extra thing that you have to do, um, as if uh, you have no, no, nothing else to do, but uh, this, then it's wrong. So it is something very important for uh, people. Uh, Madhyamaka and logic and epistemology, uh, study of these. And if you uh, think that you are not Buddhist and you don't need to study them, that's also wrong.
So the, there's uh, the practice of love, compassion, and uh, renunciation, and so forth, which are practice of Buddhism, this religion. Whereas, as they debated earlier about the uh, object of perception and the uh, subjective mind that perceives it, uh, so these uh, come as part of our knowledge. So this is uh, merely studying about these things, it's not religion study as such. So this is important to know for you. So uh, as I have been interacting with scientists over the years, uh, many scientists use this. They use that this uh, phrase, some Buddhism and sci dialogue uh, between science and Buddhism. And they say that this is not quite right to say Buddhism and science dialogue is not quite right. Because Buddhism means the religion, spirituality, Buddhism, they say. Whereas we are here discussing about, uh, not discussing about the four kayas or uh, past and future lives. But what we are studying, uh, we're discussing about is the uh, nature of mind. And therefore, uh, there is the Buddhist science. Uh, precisely what we are discussing is about the Buddhist uh, mind, uh, science. So, which is uh, one part of Buddhism, and the second part is that of uh, Buddhist concept of philosophy. And the third part is Buddhist uh, religion or spirituality, which is for uh, disciplining our mind, a uh, technique for disciplining our mind. So we uh, divide Buddhism uh, into these three categories, out of which the, uh, the presentation of uh, Buddhist science is something we uh, use to discuss. Uh, is the basis for us to have discussions with the scientists. And also some part of philosophy uh, also comes in the discussion, but uh, with this spirituality does not uh, come into the, dis uh, the picture of the discussions with the scientists. So today I wish to... Uh, so there are some, some of you dishes. So I, w I had uh, talked with Tudin Jambal, Dr. Tudin Jambal, and Kishi Chanti Doji Tamdela, who is here today. Uh, to uh, science, chemistry, and uh, other sciences. The modern subjects that are taught in the schools today. Um, using that as the basis, um, if we could uh, use the logical procedures of uh, the, the relationships between different uh, uh, things, whether they are uh, mutually exclusive or mutually inclusive or uh, contradictory, uh, synonymous and so forth. Um, uh, I have uh, suggested to include this kind of uh, procedure of uh, study the different subjects by using these logics, logical procedures that we study. So in India, I have come to uh, notice uh, that after Bodh Gaya teachings, I went to Orissa. Uh, the Tibetan uh, settlement down there, and after that, uh, the settlement, I was in Bhubaneswar, the capital of Orissa state. Uh, 
So the tourism department and the project department have, uh, of Orissa government had uh, told me that uh, they have found lots of um, Buddhist ruins of Buddhist monasteries uh, in that state, and they were taking lots of interest in Buddhism. And then after that, I was in Gujarat. Um, and the state government itself uh, is taking lo uh, it's taking lots of interest in. Uh, because they have found lots of uh, lots of uh, remains of um, Buddhist uh, relics, uh, monasteries, and so forth, and they also found a huge remain of uh, excavated a huge remains of a monastery, big monastery in Gujarat, and uh, they also found some relics of uh, Buddha, you know, the stupa, um, and also in Bihar, there's interest in. I was there just uh, on the f uh, full moon day. Uh, they have uh, built a temple there, this temple. And uh, there's so much interest in India itself on Buddhist, um, Buddhism. So I've talked, after being in these places, uh, I've talked with our Kaolin Tipa, Sandan Rinpoche. And uh, it's, I told that uh, it's very good, uh, when I went these, to these places, I said that it's very good that people are taking interest in So what is the difference between Buddhist science or science as it is taught in Buddhism? Is there a difference? Science as explained in Buddhism? As, um, philosophy as explained in Buddhism and Buddhist spirituality, perhaps we can see it like this. So in English, I said that, that Buddhism can be divided into these three categories, Buddhist science, Buddhist philosophy, and Buddhist uh, spirituality and religion. So Buddhist science and Buddhist philosophy are something universal which uh, uh, comes in the uh, period of academic studies. Whereas Buddhist religion is to do with Buddhists. So Buddhist science and Buddhist uh, uh, philosophy have nothing to do with, uh, it's not uh, only to do with Buddhism, with practice of Buddhism as, uh, per se, but uh, you have to uh, st study them in your uh, institutions, which you are going to study. So this is something academic and not about spirituality of Buddhism. So like I said, it's important to study these. Whereas if uh, people are Buddhist, then you can teach Buddhist uh, spirituality. So, for someone who practices Buddhism, then uh, Buddhist uh, spirituality, they have to study Buddhist science and Buddhist philosophy, and then go into the practice of Buddhist spirituality. So, I think that we have to make a difference here, that those who do study of Buddhist philosophy and Buddhist science uh, do, do not uh, for them, these do not become a Buddhist spirituality as such. Although we have people who are experts in the Buddhist uh, philosophy and Buddhist science, but uh, we are stuck with the language, and therefore we have to uh, study, uh, we have to perhaps start an intensive uh, program, um, workshop, where people could be trained in uh, Buddhist science, Buddhist philosophy, and Buddhist spirituality, and making these uh, three uh, distinctions teach them. As uh, the people have debated here earlier, 
uh, whether something exists or not is uh, defined by whether uh, that thing is perceived by some valid cognition or not. So this is something which can explain to anybody, scientists or anybody, uh, that things have to be positive in accordance with the valid cognition. So these may come into the category of Buddhist uh, science. And then and in the Abhi Dharma study, the texts we talk about the uh, suffering and the truth. Uh, suffering, there's uh, talk about the external and internal uh, things. Uh, in the external world there are the, the formation of the universe uh, from the different uh, elements, the subtle particles uh, building up and, and also the five different elements are taught. Uh, so this maybe uh, come into the category of Buddhist science of matter. Uh, so in both the higher uh, and lower Abhidharma, there is also the explanation of the five aggregates, the s uh, twelve uh, spheres. Um, so, which may be included in Buddhist science, external uh, material science, science of matter, whereas uh, with regard to the inner science of uh, Buddhism, it is something which is uh, unique to the uh, Indian tradition and particularly Buddhism. So there is the uh, explanation of the mind. And within uh, this explanation of mind, uh, there is also in Tantra, we can, which we can add to the Abhidharma, uh, in terms of uh, the, the, the different distinction or uh, differentiation between the subtle and gross states of mind. And then there is also the in Tantra the explanation of subtle wind energy. So perhaps we can also include this in the Buddhist uh, science. And then uh, from the lower Abhidharma, yeah, perhaps we can take uh, certain subjects like. Uh, uh, the information of the universe and so forth. Of course, there are some things which may not be so uh, relevant. So, uh, Namgil Monastery Abbot also, uh, you should take uh, pay attention to this. Uh, find in the different scriptures. Uh, the reference to these uh, Buddhist signs. So, uh, uh, when you study the collected uh, topics uh, uh, in the primer of uh, Buddhist logic, we study about the uh, positive and negative phenomena and so forth. Perhaps they also come in Buddhist uh, science, uh, philosophy. So within Buddhist science, there is the Buddhist uh, science of matter and the science of uh, mind. They can make these two uh, subdivisions and make uh, one uh, uh, curriculum for study, um, and then with regard to Buddhist philosophy.
uh, the uh, presentations or uh, topics such as the uh, negative or uh, positive phenomena and so forth may come to this category. In Buddhist uh, logic, we talk about uh, it is said that the uh, words, uh, language, and uh, the conceptual mind engage in objects by um, eliminating or uh, something uh, from the objects uh, by elimination. Uh, and then there is also the uh, uh, there of uh, interdependence, causal interdependence, and uh, the interdependence by way of designation. So within which uh, the, uh, how minds, uh, our minds kind of operate on the objects come into this category. Of and also the causality comes into this where we reject that uh, the uh, things do not come from the um, uh, creator. So I'm not quite sure whether uh, when it comes to the uh, subjects like uh, object of perception so forth, uh, whether it has to be included in this philosophy or this science. So there is the Buddhist philosophy and Buddhist uh, science. And within Buddhist science, we can take things from the Buddhist tantra. And in Buddhist philosophy, the causality, the de interdependence in terms of causality and interdependence in terms of uh, designation, uh, within which there are different presentations from uh, the, the non-Buddhist traditions. So if you want, uh, those who have debated today, they debated about the uh, two truths according to the Sutantrika uh, philosophy uh, school. Um, you should not think that that is the only way of presenting the two truths uh, in Buddhism. Uh, whereas, uh, because if you only th uh, if you think that that is the only way of pres uh, explaining the two truths, then when you come to Madhyamaka, you may find it quite uh, perplexing. Uh, thinking of what have we uh, studied earlier. Uh, so, and then there is the presentation of the uh, different tenet systems. Uh, they are taught uh, the philosophy of uh, the Chittamatra and uh, the Yogacara Savatantra Ramadhyamaka. Um, So the uh, the genre of text that uh, uh, we find in Tibetan called Tupta, the system of uh, the philosophical systems, study of philosophical systems, come of course from the Indian uh, sources, such as Bhaveka and so forth. So if we could. Uh, Settle with some uh, curriculum for uh, some syllabus for study in the schools of Buddhist science and Buddhist philosophy. Uh, perhaps many scholars could gather together and uh, uh, make such uh, curriculum. And then, when it, uh, with regard to the debate. Uh, it com this comes within the category of this philosophy, uh, where direct perceptions are said to operate on objects uh, directly, uh, whereas the conceptual mind and uh, language operate or engage with objects uh, through elimination. And there is there are also the uh, explanation of or the different types of mind uh, in our uh, tenets. 
and logic and reasoning. Perhaps this can be uh, could be a separate subjects. But the objective is not only for Buddhists. Of course, Buddhists can study this, but even for non-Buddhists, uh, who could at least then uh, recognize that there is such a thing called Buddhist uh, philosophy and logic, which is not uh, uh, so. Through this, we can uh, make big contribution to the world at large. So, if I explain like this to you, perhaps your students could also uh, get some idea about such and such things uh, there are in uh, Buddhism. So I thought to share this, and then we have a question and answer session. So after being in America, I was a little bit unwell. I had fever. So today I'm a bit better. So I do not have anything special to uh, say about Buddhism, but uh, I just say, read this book. So first we'll have question and answer session. So, did you get some idea about uh, about how rich our Tibetan culture is, and how much we can contribute? We can contribute to the world. Have you got some idea about it? Is there some point in it? So, I'm saying that you have to know that there is such a thing. So if I am feel good, uh, if, I, if my uh, health doesn't deteriorate, or uh, I'll come to t tomorrow also. But if I feel uh, worse, t then I will. As long as he's talking in Tsang dialect, um, then I'd say, "Excuse me," to from tomorrow's session. So you can ask any kind of question. So with regard to the uh, Buddhist science and Buddhist uh, philosophy, Tara uh, Rinpoche has written a book, a uh, Tibetan master who uh, lived in Denmark. And uh, there is a program called, uh, called Unity in D Duality, which he had studied. So he's asking his holiness uh, opinion. Uh, uh, Rinpoche has started this uh, program called Unity and uh, Duality. Unity and Duality. Uh, whether it's good to include this in the subject well, for study in schools. Uh, so with regard to this uh, interdependent nature of things. So the two Tibetan words, Ten Jung, Ten Dil, are synonymous, and I think this comes in under the category of Buddhist uh, philosophy. So when it, uh, with regard to interdependence, uh, the Buddha said that things did, uh, did have not come uh, from uh, uh, 
uh, without any causes, but uh, nor have they come from any uh, permanent unchanging causes, nor have, are they created by some um, kind of a creator God. So perhaps uh, it is more relevant to recognize the uh, understanding of relativity um, in uh, the Buddhist philosophy to include it in the Buddhist philosophy. So first of all, he prayed his own stood up long. Okay. So he was uh, this boy is referring to uh, Jetron Kappa's text called the three principal aspects of that part. It's quite a technical thing where it says uh, so the, ex uh, the extreme view of uh, Eternalism is overcome through uh, the perception of appearances, uh, whereas uh, the uh, nihilism is overcome through that of uh, emptiness. So, in Kung Dang uh one of his writings, he says. With regard to appearance and emptiness, they sequentially uh, overcome the uh, nihilism and eternalism. This is something which all the Buddhist philosophical schools accept commonly. Whereas the other way around, uh, which is to say, uh, the eternalism being overcome through uh, appearance and uh, the, uh, the nihilism being overcome through emptiness. Understanding of emptiness is something which is unique to uh, the Prasangika Madhyamaka. So the other uh, philosophical schools say that if uh, everything is merely imputed by mind, then uh, uh, even in uh, they say that if things do not have uh, exist from their side, then uh, if it's only merely imputed, then uh, you, know, you would think about anything and they should exist. Uh, or is that not the case? Even uh, amongst the Buddhist uh, Madhyamaka philosophy, uh, the uh, philosophers such as Bhav Viveka assert that uh, things should exist from their side as well. For example, when it comes to uh, finding the, uh, the uh, real self, a person, uh, he points to the consciousness. So when Prasankita say that uh, the appearance is uh, actually uh, rejects that of uh, uh, it, uh, eternalism. Although things appear to have some existence from their side, but the mere appearance itself shows that they do not have any essence in themselves. 
if they would to have some essence in themselves, then we have to be able to find it uh, the, when we do investigation analysis. Um, for example, if you see a mirage and think that there is water there, if there is a real water there, then you should be able to find water uh, when you actually go for search, um, in search of it, whereas you don't find it. So this shows that there is no things do not, uh, although things do appear to have some essence, uh, that there is no, no such way of existence from their side, and therefore you find that it's like illusion. So although there are, things do have, appear to have some uh, self-existence from their side, that is merely because of our uh, a distorted uh, perception, and therefore they exist, they do exist, but merely in name. Uh, because when you, when you become certain that, uh, gain certitude that they don't exist the way they appear, uh, they, uh, it shows that their, their existence is merely by a uh, way of imputation, but merely in name. So Kirub Northland Gyatso has said that um, to an eye perception uh, which sees two moons uh, out of some uh, visual uh, defect in, uh, in the eye, uh, the person who knows that there's no two, there are no two moons out there, but still because of the uh, problem in his eyes, now uh, he sees these two and uh, is able to uh, ascertain to himself that there are uh, no two moons but only one. Although uh, it does appear to me that the uh, two moons now do appear to me. So I'm not able to remember the, uh, what Kedem Nathanjaj has said. Someone is asked if anybody knows uh, this, the first two lines or so. So Kirit Nosan Gyatso basically is saying that when we say some things are empty, it doesn't mean that things do not function, do not have any function. They are uh, not, uh, absent, they're absent of any functionality, but uh, emptiness here means that they do not exist uh, in and of themselves. Uh, therefore, uh, he says, the uh, appearance and emptiness are the two sides of the coin. Um, one side is that of the in, uh, undeceptive uh, uh, dependence, interdependence, and the other side is that of the uh, emptiness of true uh, existence. So emptiness has to be understood in that way. Uh, the, in the sense of being absent of any essence. To the mind which perceives emptiness, uh, no other uh, objects really uh, come into the perception. Um, as in the collective topics you study about the positive and negative uh, phenomena. Emptiness is a negative phenomena, which is uh, uh, more precisely uh, called non-implicative uh, negative. So when you think about this house, the uh, perception that there's no elephant in this uh, hall is an invalid cognition. So when, when you say uh, there's no elephant here, that perception 
takes the fact that the absence, fact of the absence of the elephants as its object. So that's the kind of uh, non-implicative negative. So when you say there is no elephant, and you think there is no elephant here, but if you say there is no elephant but, then that is also a negative uh, uh, phenomena, but uh, uh, it's uh, implicative uh, negative phenomena. So if you think there is no elephant but a cat is running here, then that kind of perception becomes uh, like a perception of a negative uh, phenomena called implicative negative phenomena. So when you are in your mind are totally sure uh, uh, have this certitude that things do not have any intrinsic existence from their side, that perception does not take any other object uh, as a perceived object, but that mere absence. So just uh, thinking that there's nothing, uh, there's nothing there when you think there's no self. So after that perception, uh, subsequently that, then you find uh, that because they do not exist, things do not exist from their own side. Uh, they are uh, their existence is merely by way of interdependence that your uh, imputation of this and that thing through that the things exist and that's way, the way you have to understand how uh, the uh, cognition of the appearance uh, does away with uh, the the f uh, permanence. Whereas when you think emptiness, and empty doesn't here mean that nihilism, but emptiness here means that things do, do not have any existence from their own side, but they are uh, dependent. And then you understand that uh, emptiness, uh, if you understand emptiness in, in the sense of uh, dependence, then you are able to do away with the idea of uh, nihilism. So the quotation that you are talking about uh, refers to this. After having gained uh, certitude and uh, emptiness, So if you find emptiness through different logic, uh, logics, such as uh, reasoning of dependence or the reasoning of the sevenfold reasoning and so forth, and suppose you have gained a certitude and emptiness through these logics, but you are not able to, uh, if you are not able to uh, gain certitude in uh, the uh, dependent and the dependence of things, but think that uh, you know, the things do not really exist at all, then uh, then you uh, almost tend to fall into nihilism. Um, whereas if those who assert that things do not have any essence, they do not exist from their own side, of course they too do uh, uh, engage in the, uh, the daily activities such as taking meals and so forth. 
Domtaba has said that uh, that your hand is uh, and essentially empty, and the fire is essentially empty. Although they both are essentially empty, if you put your hand into the fire, you'll burn. So there's no. So if your understanding of emptiness is not able to complement the uh, understanding of the the uh, dependent nature of things and and vice versa, and you are uh, not able to uh, it is said that, uh, by the Kaba that you have not yet uh, understood the deepest uh, intention of the Buddha. But because the uh, working of the causality is right there uh, before us, uh, if the effects are dependent on causes and conditions, and if uh, the whereas if the effects were to exist for truly from the outside, its own side, then it does not need to depend on causes and conditions. So this is uh, one uh, way of talking about dependence. So except those uh, philosophical schools uh, like uh, Lokayatas or uh, the, uh, those who assert uh, things arising from uh, permanent causes and conditions or so but this interdependence is something which uh, is a unique uh, tenet of uh, Buddhism. So long as you assert some kind of a creator uh, out there, a permanent uh, creator, unchanging creator, which uh, creates all these things in the world, then you cannot understand uh, interdependence fully. Whereas uh, all the Buddhist uh, philosophical schools assert uh, their interdependence. And uh, they say that uh, effects arise from causes. Now those who assert that things are merely interdependent even assert that not only that the effects are dependent on causes, but the causes themselves are dependent on the uh, effects. So because when you say something is a cause, uh, you have to uh, posit it in relation to something else, and therefore it is a cause in relation to the, the effect. And therefore the cause does not, uh, cannot exist independently. So when you see the cause and effects, the effects are interdependent. You understand that they do not exist independently. They have no such independent existence on their own. And then Anantam um, Babu goes on to see uh, the rest of the things. Um, how the appearance uh, uh, displays is that of uh, eternalism and so forth. So these, for these, you have to really think over and over. So this, uh, your question was, uh, was a good question. You, uh, when the boy asked the question, he said lump sum or three parts, whereas he should have said lump sum. Namsum, which means, so I, when he first used this uh, word, three parts, I was thinking whether he was asking about the Shravaka, Pratyaka, and Bodhisattva parts. My question is, uh, 
has to do with uh, Vinaya, the monastic code of discipline. He's uh, asking whether Bhikshuni uh, lineage exists in the Tibetan tradition. Uh, So his question was basically, uh, he said that uh, the women in the Tibetan tradition, we don't have the bhikshuni lineage, and therefore women are uh, lacking a certain kind of human rights. So, so according to Vinaya, uh, we have to follow the rules laid down by the Buddha himself. We do not have the right to change the Vinaya. Um, and so George Atisha has said in the Vikramala Shilla uh, monastery when they have to decide about something uh, they have to uh, the monks came together and decided whether some uh, that thing uh, the the monastery has to do uh, accords with the Vinaya and particularly Bodhisattva uh, scriptures. So, but Vinaya is very important. Uh, it is said that whether the Buddhist uh, tradition of Buddhism is, uh, remains or not is uh, dependent uh, on the, whether there is the practice of the uh, Vinaya. So when the Buddha was alive, I'm not being uh, sarcastic here, uh, when Buddha was alive, just uh, him, the, when the Buddha himself calls on somebody to come, come here, then immediately the person gets uh, uh, ordination, ordained. Whereas uh, then uh, later on he laid down the rules of the monastic uh, institutions to, uh, that uh, you have to have certain number of monks, uh, the preceptor, master preceptor, and the activity master, and so forth, in order for uh, people to get ordination. And there are certain numbers of monks uh, that, that have to be uh, the, a required number of monks in, certain, uh, in the central lands. Uh, are, Whereas in the remote places there are the numbers, less number of requ uh, monks required. Whereas for the bhikshuni ordination, I think it's uh, the uh, preceptor has to be a bhikshuni, and then the uh, activity master uh, have, has to be a uh, bhikshu. And then there have to be other uh, big shoes who assist the ordination. And if uh, the required number of the assistants uh, is, uh, is ten, then there have to be five big shoes and five big shoes uh, for the ordination. Uh, the Vinaya tradition that we have. Uh, it comes from uh, Master Nagarjuna, and the uh, school is, uh, that we belong to is the Mula Sarvasti Vadan. Uh, whereas in China, the uh, uh, Vinaya tradition uh, is the uh, lineage of Kashyapa, and then uh, the, the school that they follow is that of Dharmagupta.
So we have to do uh, for the investigation in, uh, in terms of how they really ordain uh, big shunis. Uh, I met a group uh, from a Buddhist group from Singapore. The leader of the group was Lang. 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 So the leader was from Sri Lanka, and then uh, there were two ladies who said they long. They, uh, the two ladies who were wearing uh, long, uh, their robes like the uh, Christian nuns, actually, with their uh, gray uh, robes with uh, uh, head gear. Uh, so I told them that in uh, God, uh, Buddhist nuns and uh, monks and nuns should not be aware. Uh, so uh, I told them that Buddhist monks and nuns are not allowed to wear black and uh, other colors, which are supposed to be colors of the lay people. Uh, so this uh, monk has supposedly, uh, got, apparently, this monk uh, ordains these nuns. So I, when I saw these nuns, I thought uh, things are not quite right. Kind of. of course, it's not our business, uh, but according to the Vinaya, yeah, that is quite strange that they said they were uh, Buddhist bhikshunis, whereas they were wearing uh, some uh, robes with uh, sleeves, and the color was grayish, uh, bluish, sort of thing. And uh, uh, so I ha we have to still check whether this the uh, the way they ordain bhikshunis uh, in uh, the Chinese lineage. Uh, and I met also a Vietnamese monk. Uh, who, And so we have to really do some uh, further investigation into the procedure of ordination that is followed in China. So the Vinaya tradition that we Tibetans follow is that uh, the uh, the Vinaya scripture was translated into Tibetan from Sanskrit, whereas the Theravada tradition, they have uh, their text originally in Pali. Uh, so, according to the Pali t uh, tradition of Vinaya, they have uh, about 220 or 27 vows. Whereas uh, in the Mula Saravastavada tradition, we have 253 vows for monks. So the uh, number of vows that they keep uh, slightly differ from us. Where So is there a certain difference in the number of uh, different vows that we um, that are about amongst key? It seems Whereas uh, there is one uh, set of vows where, uh, which in the Pramula Sarvas the number is 90, to, uh, 90, whereas in the uh, Pali it's 92. Um, but what I clearly remember is that in the Pali uh, Sutra, 
it's mentioned that according, uh, with regard to the lower uh, robe that the monks wear, the uh, it has to be uh, worn uh, in a roundish manner, whereas in uh, so that's the only one mentioned about uh, the manner of wearing the lower robes. Whereas in Tibetan uh, Pratimoksha Sutra, uh, there's mention of seven different uh, ways in which the monk, uh, lower robe has to be worn, such as not uh, too. I mean, uh, uh, long like an elephant's tusk or it's not hanging to the uh, low like an elephant tusk and so forth and not too tight of course there are sometimes in the Vinaya text uh, there are uh, exceptions given so the thought to the uh, according to that uh, exceptions, then uh, some uh, Vinaya masters say that perhaps we could have a, a big shoe leading the ordination uh, as the preceptor of the ordination, but uh, others say this is not possible in our tradition. So it has been uh, quite a long time since we have been uh, investigating into this and we had uh, three or four conferences uh, one time it was held in a conference about Bhikshun ordination was held in Nobelenka here in terms of uh, Sidbari uh, one Chinese abbot also came at that time so with regard to Vinaya when it comes to uh, the Vinaya vows and ordination and all these, we have to follow the uh, rules laid down by the Buddha, as we find in the... So from the point of view of human rights, uh, it may be true that uh, we are not giving equal right to the women, uh, Tibetan women, by not having Vikshuni ordination. But uh, when it comes to studying the Dharma, philosophy, uh, we started here in Dharmasala in Gadin Chering Nunnery. Uh, so at that time, during the inaugural ceremony for studying the Buddhism, uh, Buddhist philosophy, It's been perhaps 40 years uh, at the time I went to the nunnery and then uh, I uh, gave a teaching on uh, Abhisamaya Alankara in the nunnery. And then uh, I also have uh, suggested to have geshe, uh, female geshes. And some of the geshes objected to that. That's not possible. And then I said, but, uh, Buddha himself has ordained big shoes and big shoes both. And therefore, they ha he has given equal rights to the men and women. So why not Geshe Mahas? So we are uh, trying to find out how we can uh, uh, decide about the Geshe Ma uh, degree for the nuns. Uh, there are many, uh, many of the, uh, the nuns have really studied well. So. Let me have So when we study but this philosophy in our schools and in philosophy it says that we have uh, there's no beginning to the samsara whereas there is uh, there's an end to each uh, sentient beings. But the number of sentient beings is um, it's numberless. Sentient beings are numberless. So I don't know how to s translate that, but um, it's none of your business sort of thing, is all this says. So uh, how come all the, the, if the number of sentient beings is numberless, then how is it possible? 
uh, the question was that. So, in general, uh, we can say there is no uh, so of course if you take each and every sentient being, then each and every sentient being can ultimately become a Buddha. Therefore, uh, from that point of view, it is said that there is an end to samsara. Whereas if you take the sentient beings as a whole, then perhaps because it's uh, numberless or infinite, there's, therefore it, um, there's no end. So that doesn't really make... So, uh, so that's why his Holiness said that it's something that he uh, is poking into uh, uh, the people's business kind of thing. I'm sorry, I can't hear him. It's very strong arm to exit. there was a Geshe. It's not good to mention his name. He knew English quite well. And he gave a talk in uh, at the Tibetan Library. <laughs> and the Tibetans who listened to him uh, th thought that he was speaking in Tibetan. In English, whereas uh, Tibetan, whereas uh, the English, uh, the uh, uh, Westerners who were there thought he was speaking t uh, in Tibetan or something like that. So nobody really understood him. <laughs> so now Geshe Losan Dawala is trying to read the question. Um, So our Tibetan language and its usage is a standard language in the world, international language, whereas uh, it's not being used properly in our society and uh, in exile. And uh, the, the Tibetan youth are uh, not taking much interest in learning Tibetan language. Whereas back in Tibet, there are people who have set up organizations to preserve and uh, pr promote our language. And His Holiness has uh, given uh, many uh, lectures where he has emphasized on uh, preserving the language. But uh, this does not seem to be effect uh, proving effective in the exile community. So what is your opinion? So that's true, as I said. I think it was during the first uh, general body meeting of the uh, Tibetan uh, teachers in different schools, uh, convened by the uh, Tibetan uh, Department of Education. We heard the suggestion that uh, the different subjects that are uh, taught in the schools uh, should be trans slowly translated into Tibetan, and then the Tibetan children should be taught in Tibetan. And at that time, there was a couple from a Polish, uh, uh, a Polish uh, couple. The late, we used to call him 
uh, Poland uh, Pola, old uh, man from Poland. He suggested that we have to, uh, the teachers should uh, translate the, uh, the subjects they are taught teaching into Tibetan uh, before they go to class the next day. They have to, to uh, translate whatever they're going to teach the next day into Tibetan and then go to class. Uh, in the 1950s, when I was in China, I visited uh, in the coastal region of China. There is a Dongpen uh, area called Dongpen, uh, where Koreans used to live. So during that visit, the university there was uh, teaching uh, the different subjects in their language. Uh, Korean, yeah. Okay. So, so at that uh, conference, uh, no, we had the suggestion that uh, these the different subjects should be taught in Tibetan. And now, in TCB school, uh, has start schools have started teaching the different subjects. Uh, from the kindergarten up to class five uh, to teach everything in Tibetan. And therefore, the students don't have to struggle with the language. Uh, whereas, if they have to be taught in English, then uh, it proves a little bit difficult because of the language. So there is an understanding that uh, it's better to teach Tibetan kids uh, in Tibetan. So we have another school, uh, the model school, I think he's always talking about, um, where these uh, different things, uh, subjects are taught in Tibetan only. Of course, uh, there is some problem here because when students uh, graduate from their schools and go into higher studies in co college and universities, most of them had to uh, study th uh, through the medium of English. So in the f last 50 years uh, of our exile, the beginning, of course, we were not even clear about where we were going, our our direction, and then after 20 years of being in exile, we tried to make some improvement in terms of uh, uh, teaching the different subjects. There has been some lags somewhere. Uh, So we have to find out the causes for this and try to make sure that this does not happen in the future. So last year we had a, a conference of the uh, schools. Uh, and everybody was uh, expressing their views then. Even in back in Tibet, it seems that in certain regions, it seems the uh, people are really working hard on teaching different subject in Tibetan, and Tibetan is being really uh, uh, promoted. Whereas in the Tibet Autonomous Region, it seems that there is restriction from the Chinese government to teach in Tibetan. And I met uh, one, someone from the Lhasa uh, University, Tibet University. He said that when uh, after Ten Kunian came to Tibet, uh, teaching the different subjects in uh, Tibetan language was stopped. Uh, before that, they used to teach in Tibetan uh, the different texts, uh, like Nagarjuna's uh, letter to a friend, and so forth. But after that uh, Ten Kunyan's visit to Tibet, everything was uh, changed, that uh, people had to translate everything into Chinese and then teach it. Um, 
um, and then uh, I don't know if it's true, but last year I heard that last year from the Tibet Autonomous Region uh, there was a letter. A letter was written to the central uh, government of China. Uh, that uh, Chinese is being used as the primary language to teach uh, and not Tibetan. And the monasteries are just turned into like a, a tourist attraction and uh, uh, there should not be a study of Buddhism in these big monasteries. So there has been such a letter written to the central government. But perhaps uh, some parents think that if they don't, if their kids do not uh, don't uh, learn Chinese, then they cannot get high marks in the exams. Whereas uh, those who are good in Tibetan, uh, during the exams, they they get really low marks. Uh, whereas those who have uh, who know uh, Chinese uh, get higher marks and they get the better opportunity to study, um, to pursue higher studies in China. Whereas those who are good in Tibetan do not have that opportunity. And therefore, the parents uh, think about uh, the employment for their kids. And uh, they also uh, put effort in uh, educating their children in Chinese. So we are under the um, power of others, so we have no freedom, you know, they, they do not have freedom in t Tibet. So that's the situation, whereas we in exile are, uh, have freedom. So as I said earlier, uh, uh, the, the, the cream of the culture of Tibet, uh, Tibetan culture has to be uh, shown through the uh, that of Buddhism, for which the, uh, we have to use our language. And if we have more and more students in the schools, uh, who have a uh, very high standard of Tibetan, uh, like the different uh, Dharma terminology. Uh, and then when they become parents, uh, their kids will have better Tibetan. Whereas the, the present situation is such that uh, most of the majority of the common people do not have any idea about the Buddhist uh, terminology. Uh, they're very high. Uh, So this language that we have, uh, we have. To, if we can feel proud of uh, its potentiality uh, for uh, contributing to the world at large, and also to our own culture, uh, then we would be able to really help. Uh, Uh, through many Tibetan uh, students who may go into these higher institutions, universities and so forth. Of course, there has been some lags, and uh, I cannot say anything, but we are sorry about it. The differentiation between um, Buddhist and non-Buddhist is um, done, uh, made on the basis of taking refuge. If we prostrate or pay homage to the non-Buddhist uh, deities or gods, do we lose the precept of taking refuge? Perhaps uh, there is a difference in how you pay homage. 
So I usually say that uh, all the religions in the world have to be harmonious. Uh, this is a sincere um, urge, uh, not just out of polity. So when you say uh, you have to respect all religions, you have to make distinction between respect and faith. So to your own tradition, religion, you uh, be, uh, have faith in it, whereas to the other uh, religious faiths, you, ha you can have respect to them. There is a distinction between these two, respect and uh, faith. So, faith has to do with one's own uh, religion, whereas respect to other traditions as well. So we say we respect the, our parents and uh, we uh, have faith in our gurus. So for the la past thousands of years, the different religions have been really helpful to their followers and therefore you have to uh, acknowledge that and uh, respect them. Whereas to your own tradition, you have faith. Uh, to the your faith, you should have faith in the Buddha, the founder of Buddhism. So understanding that the Buddha is the one who has overcome all his uh, faults. Uh, shortcomings and you can uh, prostrate to the Buddha whereas I uh, in my case I pay respect to Jesus Christ uh, I do not make prostration as such but I pay respect because you uh, acknowledge that uh, Jesus uh, the teaching of Jesus Christ himself has really helped uh, uh, many uh, people and it shows the path of morality and so forth. Of course there are people who may be misbehave even as Christians and uh, that <coughs> so you can fold your hands like this if you uh, if there's no nothing wrong with it uh, you can uh, prostrate, but uh, to other uh, religious traditions, you can acknowledge the uh, fact that they have been really uh, helpful to humanity uh, immensely and therefore pay respect. So you have to hear, be sure about the difference between Buddhism and non-Buddhist uh, non traditions. So it's uh, questionable whether you really uh, take refuge in Buddhist, Buddha, Dharma and Sangha uh, by just saying I take refuge in the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha. Because in the past in Tibet there used to be Muslims, uh, Tibetan Muslims, who would swear by the Three Jewels. So that doesn't mean they have faith in the Three Jewels. So there's a saying that uh, Buddhist, uh, the difference between Buddhism and non-Buddhist traditions is made on the basis of uh, taking refuge and also on the basis of the philosophical views. Uh, the second uh, case uh, is particularly said by uh, Jamil Shepa in his uh, big text on tenets. So you have to be able to uh, generate faith in the Buddha by understanding the Dharma which basically means understanding the possibility of 
the true cessation, uh, finding that it is something possible that you can uh, actually experience. And then once you attain uh, this true cessation within yourself, or uh, when someone attains it, that person becomes a Sangha jewel. So His Holiness has written this prayer uh, called the uh, Supplication to the Seventeen Masters of Nalanda, wherein he says, May I find uh, 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 find the principle of taking refuge through understanding and awareness, uh, through valid cognition by understanding the four truths, uh, which in turn uh, uh, should be based on the understanding of the two truths. So here you have to understand how the ignorance can be uh, overcome. So ignorance, you have to here uh, understand it, uh, what ignorance actually grasps at. This ignorance uh, which uh, perceives true existence of things, what it actually perceives. Uh, here, the, when we talk about the two truths, it's not the two truths as it is uh, uh, understood by you, the Holiness is pointing to the people who uh, de presented the debate earlier because they were doing uh, according to Sotrantika philosophy. So when you understand uh, that things do not have any true essential existence uh, in and of themselves, then you'll find that the true existence is not actually there, therefore the m ignorance which actually perceives such a way of existence is um, a wrong perception. And therefore they, you'll find that the understanding of emptiness or selflessness can go against this ignorance and thereby uh, attain the uh, true cessation. And this uh, cessation comes through the true path. Uh, of course, suffering is something that we all know that is there. Uh, nobody needs to be introduced to it, but uh, then it, when it comes to the origin of suffering, uh, the uh, sufferings come from our uh, distorted minds and uh, karma. And uh, all these delusions are finally rooted in there of ignorance. And, uh, and that way you uh, find that ignorance is something that you can overcome and therefore you find the possibility of cessation through that of the true path. And therefore you can, when you understand this, uh, you will find faith and in respect. And, in the Buddha who showed this path and uh, those who have actually experienced the true path and true cessation and uh, th uh, this way you find take refuge in the three jewels of Buddha, Dharma and Sangha. So he said uh, the question was that uh, in the text it said that the seed has to be necessarily an abstract phenomena uh, called denminduje. Uh, um, which we translate it as non-compositional, non uh, non-associated compositional factor or something like that. But uh, all seeds are not necessarily that kind of phenomena because the seed of uh, sprout is not at all uh, denminduje. 
uh, where's the sec whereas if you are talking about the imprints left on the mind uh, then perhaps that is uh, then in doje and let's try to, uh, so for that you have to go into Uh, it's quite complicated uh, when you talk uh, about this seed or the imprint. Uh, according to the Chitta Matra, there is the, the uh, mind that leaves this imprint and the imprinted um, of seed and the, on which the, conscious, uh, the consciousness on which it is left and so forth. So with regard to uh, the second part of the question, uh, you cannot posit something changing or disintegrating without uh, understanding impermanence. This, the fact that things change is because of uh, changing uh, momentarily. As soon as the thing comes into existence, it's, it's bound to change. And that change is not about a third uh, factor, but the thing itself is in that nature of change. So the first moment gives rise to the second moment, and so forth. And then with regard to causes, there we have uh, the uh, substantial cores and then the contributing factors in the external uh, world as well as in internal world of uh, our body we have uh, the co substantial causes and its uh, contributing factors and also the mind has these The substantial cause is something which actually turns into the effect. So the mind is something uh, immaterial, uh, this mere clarity and luminosity, and therefore uh, something which has that nature can produce, uh, can be produced by a f uh, the cause which has those uh, qualities. So that is where uh, Dharmakirti is saying uh, a non-mind, and something which is not a mind, cannot give rise to a mind uh, uh, as a substantial factor. The lines in Namatankapa's three principal aspects of the path, uh, which talks about the incontrovertibility of uh, the uh, cause and effect, and the uh, the suffering of uh, samsara. Perhaps uh, the terms cause and uh, karma here can be, uh, we can switch this word into gyundemilu or incontrovertible cause and effect. So instead of lendemilu, which, uh, for which uh, you have to first understand uh, that of uh, the uh, deceptive nature of cause and effect. So lende milu here can be translated as uh, lende in the sense of karma, uh, whereas yunde milu is causality. So in order to come to the conclusion that things have arisen from karma, we have to understand the working of causality. And uh, this is something which is just natural, uh, not uh, made or by uh, Buddha or anything like that. So the fact that the working of causality is something uh, deceiving uh, is nature. Just like uh, emptiness, as it's said in the text, that emptiness is not created by the Buddha, uh, but it is the nature of um, things. <laughs> Uh, 
So there's a natural process of how uh, causes can, can conditions give rise to their effects, and then when you uh, relate that cause and effect to the experience of pleasure and pain, uh, then you can talk about the working of karma, uh, which arise or uh, come about uh, through certain motivation. So pleasure and pain comes from our uh, karma, whereas the uh, experience of it, the experiencing mind, uh, is uh, comes naturally, not because of uh, karma as such. So we have the first thing about the uh, unfailing nature of uh, cause and effect. And then uh, go into the understanding of uh, uh, karma, which in turn takes in uh, the, for the uh, beginninglessness and endlessness of samsara and so forth. So, on the basis of understanding the unfailing nature of karma, you uh, understand the. the uh, pleasure and pain arising, and then there is the talk of the existential suffering. So without understanding uh, karma, there is no way we can understand past and future lives. Uh, I'm going to check whether I can come tomorrow or not. Uh, if I feel well, then I will come. If I don't feel well tomorrow, I will take rest. Would you permit me to take rest? Although I'm not here, the rest of the geishas we can continue this. Uh